Hello. Switch capacitor circuits. That's the topic for today. So we'll go through a bit about why we use these switch capacitor circuits. And since they operate in discrete time, I'm going to tell you about discrete time and the mathematics of discrete time. And a few other circuits that actually are required to implement <laughs> switch capacitor circuits. But let's start with the why. So <clears throat> I talked about this last time. We can make filters with either active RC or we could do GMC. In active RC, the pole and zero frequencies of the active RC will be proportional to G, uh, the, tr the conductance divided by C or in, in the real case, one over RC. And the variation in RC on our chips can actually be quite large. So each of the components, the resistors and capacitors will vary from die to die and from wafer to wafer and from day to day and week to week. Which means that if we actually depend on setting an accurate relationship for the pole and zero frequencies, it is not easy. Quite often, if you need an accurate pole zero frequency, you will have to trim either by changing the number of capacitors that you have in parallel or by having multiple resistors where you can connect resistors in and out. Because every single chip that we make from the same mask set is the same. Which means that any circuits that we want to use to modify our, <laughs> our um, pole and signal frequencies has to be in the chip. There's a similar relationship that can be said for the GMC filters. So shown here is the bi-quad GMC filter and the pole and zero frequencies we can see is some sort of proportionality between GM divided by C. Now the transconductance, that we can actually make proportional to one over R as we saw in lecture three for the GM cell. And that means we get roughly the same type of variation here, but maybe even a bit more because we have transistors to make up the GMC. And yeah, mismatch of transistors. And it's hard to generate accurate pole and zero frequencies or indeed hard to generate accurate gain. But there is a circuit where it's possible to make very accurate pole and zero frequencies and very accurate gain. And they are called switch capacitor circuits. Now, <clears throat> they're slightly different than <laughs> just regular continuous time circuit. So I think I'm going to start soft, hopefully relatively soft, <laughs> on trying to explain them. So, if we look at this circuit, take a moment to look at it. We have a capacitor and we have two transistors, two NMOS transistors. So the NMOS transistors here, they will be conductive or on when we have a high voltage at the gate. And the phi one here is given below and we can see those are two pulse trains and most importantly, the two, f the two uh, phi voltages, they don't overlap. So they're never high at the same time. And let's for a moment assume that this is an ideal transistor. What we want to work out is the input impedance of the circuit. In order to do that, we have to look at what is the current that flows from VI down to ground. Now, in switch capacitor circuits, we actually operate with charge. And let's start with that. <laughs> so figure, let's figure out what the charge is please, on capacitor C1 during the first, uh, so the phase two here. So during phase two, 
the voltage across the capacitor is zero because we're shorting the capacitor to grounds and the top switch here, phi one, that is open. That's not conductive. So the charge on the capacitors in at the end of phi two, that has to be zero. Okay, then we turn phi two off and we turn phi on phi one on. And if we look at the charge on the capacitor, well, the first thing is going to happen, right? The voltage on C1 at the start of phi 1, that is zero, because the voltage at the start of phi 1 has to be the same, roughly, as the uh, end of phi 2. But as soon as we open the phi 1 switch, then we'll start to charge the capacitor to VI voltage. Now, this will take some time, because the, well, <laughs> the switch will have some resistance, likely, or there will be some source impedance. So there's a certain settling behavior here, exponential sort of settling uh, behavior. But at some point in time, at the end of phi, phi 1, the voltage on the capacitor will be equal to Vi. And that's what I'm trying to note here. So the charge on the capacitor at the end and is marked by the dollar sign. This is regex notation. <laughs> if you don't know regex, don't worry. This just means the end. The charge on the capacitor at the end of phi 1 is given by C1 times the VI. And now we can actually set up the equation for CI, the input impedance. So the input impedance will be given by the voltage between VI and ground, divided by the current that flows in. Now the current that flows in is not sort of continuous in these type of circuits, it's discrete time. So there's only a sort of current flowing during the charging of the VI. And on the second phase, we're sort of dumping that charge to ground. We're setting that charge to zero. So it means the average charge or the, the um, charge per period or per unit of time in the circuit on the left is given by the charge in a certain period divided by the delta time. And delta time in this case is given by the clock frequency of phi 1. So, or phi 2 for that matter, both of the clock frequencies. So the current is given by the charge, the average charge that is sort of get lost through this uh, switch capacitor circuit times the frequency. And if we set up, if we then insert for the charges that we have above, we can get that the input impedance is the input voltage minus the ground voltage divided by the difference in charge between the two periods. So at, at the end of phi 1 minus at the end of phi 2 times the frequency. And inserting blah, 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 we get 1 over C F. And this should make some intuitive sense. So if we charge C1 to the voltage every period, then we dump that charge to ground every period. And so the average should be 1 over C1, uh, the impedance should be 1 over C1F. Okay, I want to try and draw this circuit slightly differently because quite often the um, switch capacitor circuits they don't look <coughs> necessarily they don't they're not drawn in a manner that necessarily uh, makes it intuitive to understand how they work you'll see that very soon but i'm going to try and lead you down the path of understanding switch cap circuits so let me redraw the circuit just rotate it horizontally and call the uh, output vo and we can work through exactly the same equation. So all I've done here is taking this circuit, rotate it, and rename ground. <laughs> That's all I've done. And if we insert for the same, uh, insert in the same equations, so we have the uh, impedance is given by the uh, input voltage minus the output voltage. <coughs> and underneath we have the current, so that's the difference in charge between the two periods times the frequency. Now the, the charge in the first at the end of first period here, phi 1, that's equal to C1, 
and the difference in voltage. So in this case, when phi1 is on, then we have a connection from Vi to the capacitor, and phi2 is open, so the other side of the capacitor is connected to Vo, which means the voltage across the capacitor must be uh, Vi minus Vo. The charge on the capacitor at the end of the second period, that's when we have phi2 on, that has to be zero, because there's no voltage across the capacitor. And, no surprise, we end up getting the same impedance as if uh, VO was the ground. That's simply because if I rename this, call this as a DC voltage source of zero, then obviously it's the same circuit. The reason I do this is I want to go one step further and convince you that the circuit that you're looking at now is going to give you the, roughly the same behavior, at least in the ideal case. Now I have one switch towards VI and another switch towards VO. So setting up the same impedance equation, the difference in voltage divided by the current, which is the difference in charge between the two periods, times the frequency. In the first period, we'll have at the end of phi1, so that's when phi1 is on, I'm charging the capacitor to VI, so that's what it says here. I see I've gotten an extra parenthesis in my equation. Just ignore that for now. At the end of phi2, so that's when phi2 transistor is on and phi1 transistor is off, then the voltage on the capacitor has to be out VO. So my charge is C1VO. And now if I insert in the equation, I get the same impedance. So both the circuit here and the circuit here are equivalent, they have the same charge transfer function, same impedance. <clears throat> okay, so that's sort of the concept of switch capacitor. And people really like using this to generate accurate gain, because that's the key of switch capacitor circuit, accurate gain and accurate pulse zero frequencies. The circuit on the, um, let me go full screen for this, let's see. So the uh, circuit on the right is from a pretty old Pipeline ADC paper. And what you're looking at is the input buffer. So we have the differential input voltage given by in plus and in minus. We have switches, transmission gates, so a PMOS and an NMOS. And then there's a second transition gate. And then we have a couple of capacitors. So let's look at what happens during phi1. So during phi1, the op-amp inputs are connected to ground, which means that we sample the input voltage across our capacitors, C1. That's the first phase. And in the same phase, we also disconnect the op-amp output from the capacitors C1. Oh, I see it has the same name, but the feedback capacitor. <laughs> no, it's a C1, yeah, so there's four, four C1s here, and then C1, so there's a one to four ratio. So from the feedback capacitor, we disconnect the output voltage of the op-amp, we connect both sides of the feedback capacitor to ground, which means there's zero charge across that capacitor. Okay, so this is all that happens in the first period. Let's ignore for a moment the common mode feedback, the switch capacitor common mode feedback at the output here. The second thing that happens is that we disable phi1 and then we enable phi2. When we enable phi2, we short the left side of the capacitors and by doing that, we're actually, as long as the op-amp does its thing and the plus and the minus input are the same, well, then there is zero differential charge across the C4 and uh, the 4C1, so f these two capacitors. So zero differential charge just means that the charge across these capacitors, the voltage on the left side and the voltage on the right side, that's, uh, well, it doesn't have to be the same voltage, but we have to have the same charge. So let's say, for example, there's one volt across the uh, 4C capacitor, well, then there's one volt on both sides and then in the same direction. 
but our input signal will actually be stored in a differential voltage, such that, well, anyway, uh, never mind. Uh, in phi 2, the 4C capacitances will have zero differential voltage across it, and that also means zero differential charge. But we just sampled a input voltage in the previous period that was equal to, well, the input times 4C. And in this case, we actually have different uh, inputs. So we have N plus and N minus. So there is a differential input voltage. So that means at some point in the previous period, we had a differential charge. So that charge cannot have just disappeared. It, it must still be there somewhere. It cannot, charge cannot disappear. It is conserved. So those electrons must be somewhere else in the circuit. And the trick about switch capacitor circuits and uh, using an op amp like this is that you'll find that differential charge across the feedback capacitors. So you can actually think about it like this. I store a charge of four times my input voltage on the input capacitors. I take that same charge, differential charge, and place it across my feedback capacitors of C. Now, since the input capacitors are four times larger, well, if I place it on a smaller capacitor, then the output voltage must be four times larger because the charge must be the same. So what I have in this picture is a controlled gain that is four. <laughs> very accurately for, because the accuracy in switch cap circuits is only determined by the settling, so the time that you allow the circuit to settle, uh, and that's given by the, uh, well, the settling time is given by the switches and the op-amp uh, transient behavior, and also the DC gain of the op-amp. So if the DC gain of the op-amp is very, very high, well, 60 to, um, let's say 60 dB, then, well, it's slightly off, but let's, Assume for a moment, ignore the, f the um, feedback factor. But roughly the accuracy of that gain will be given by the loop gain of the op amp. So if we have a 60 dB, that's a thousand times, which means that the gain error will be on the order of 0.1%. 1 over a 1,000, and that's an incredibly accurate gain. And then it's pretty much determined by the feedback factor and, and the op-amp gain, which means that we can create ex insanely precise gains, and that is extremely useful in pipeline converters. Th at the same time, we can also make filters with um, switch capacitor circuits, as we'll see a bit later, and then the pole and zero frequencies are proportional to a relationship between capacitors. And a relationship between capacitors we can actually make quite accurate on a integrated circuit to the position of about 0.1%. So that's why. That's why switch capacitors are cool, or why we need them. But they use discrete time. And that needs an introduction. So let's get going. And now it's, it's going to get a bit mouthy because... Mathematics is a wonderful way of structuring advanced thinking and also knowing that you're right because you can prove things to be true within mathematics. So what I'm going to slightly go through now is how the book, the, advanced, uh, the analog design book. Let's see. Let me just show you that. It's in the first lecture, but this book how that explains it. Now we're not going to derive this, but let me just go through how it explains it. So imagine that we have a continuous time signal. Continuous time, continuous value, xc. We want to turn that into a discrete time representation of the same signal. So what we could do is if we define a single sample of that signal, that's kind of equivalent to taking the xc at a certain time, 
n times a certain time interval, t, and then having a step function. So the L of t here is a step function, where uh, at t minus nt, so before that time, it is 0, and after that time, it is 1. And here, we're adding a small delta period. So what you'll see on the... Well, I'm trying to draw around here. <laughs> that is that kind of like a step function. So we're multiplying a step with our continuous time, continuous value signal, and we're dividing by the time period. And we can sort of change the period, this uh, tau, and all that does is really um, normalize, kind of. Well, we end up with a one piece of that continuous time signal. So we could define a sampled version of that continuous time signal as an infinite sum of all those small pieces. So we, if we take every single piece, every single n times a certain period, and we combine them all, that's the sum here, that's sort of our sampled signal. Okay, but why would we do this? Well, it turns out, once we have now a definition of what is a sampled signal, we can look at the implications uh, in the frequency domain, kind of. So, <clears throat> our sampled signal of the continuous time, continuous value signal, is this infinite sum of these pulse trains, so single samples of the continuous time, continuous value signal. We can do then a Laplace transform, Laplace transform of that signal, and they've done that, and don't ask me why, but this is <laughs> this is the Laplace transform. And we can keep going. Let's see what's done here. So here's just uh, is for a single unit. So that's this is pretty much the uh, Laplace transform for a single sort of step function, not step, but it, it's a pulse function. And then we have for all of the pulse functions, it's sort of the sum of all those individual ones. Now. If we allow the time period to go to zero, so sort of the, the duration of that pulse that we sample with, then we end up with that the sampled uh, spectrum is sort of an infinite sum of shifted spectra. So this e to the minus s and t, that's kind of like shifting the input signal in frequency. And that's what we can see at the bottom here. If we just insert uh, for j omega in the s, we can see that our sampled spectrum is an infinite sum of the original signal at that frequency minus some sort of integral or uh, minus something that is related to the sampling period. So, spectrum of a sample signal is an infinite sum of frequency shifted spectra. And this is quite important. Now, normally when you do an FFT, you won't see this because your, your FFT is based on the sample rate, but I'll try and demonstrate. So, in the dt.py, uh, you can click the link, and that should bring you to my GitHub page. And you can, let's see, and you can find the code there. So in order to see the sampled spectra, I'm trying to create a continuous time, continuous value in the computer. That's not possible. Or my computer is discrete time. It runs on ones and zeros. But anyway, we can get as close to, as we want to a continuous time uh, type of signal. So. <clears throat> First, just creating a time vector, something that varies. This is just a change from 0 to 8192. And then I create a number of sinusoids. So slightly different frequencies. So F1 is the frequency, and here is the, um, well, it's going to be... Yeah, I, d I can't do this in my head. <laughs> doesn't really matter. This is a combination of a couple of different uh, 
sinusoid. And once I have my original sort of continuous time signal, then I can create the sampled version. And the way I'm doing that is adding a sampling pattern. I'm multiplying with this pulse train. So 11000, zero, 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 that's my pulse train. And the tile function here just takes this uh, short sequence and then uh, repeats it many times. So it sort of mul multiplies it with a pulse train. And then I can get my um, my pulse train signal is sort of the combination of, I should have called this XC to get <laughs> the same notation as in the book, but it doesn't matter. I end up with a signal here that is a sampled version of this continuous time signal. And then I plot it in an FFT, and let's have a look. So, <clears throat> Apologies. On the left side, it's not easy to see actually, but we have our continuous value, continuous time signal. On the right side, we have the sampled version. You can't really see that from the spectrum. It's not easy for me to see at least. Now this is a combination of multiple sinusoids, so we can see it here. We have a sinus at, um, well, positive frequency and then I have a sinus at negative frequency and those frequencies correspond to what I added in my code. So here you can see the fundamental, the F1, and then we have the two around at plus minus uh, FD compared to the F1. And that's what you see here. One, two, three, one, two, three. Now this is a complex FFT, so it's showing both positive and negative frequencies because all FFTs are complex. It's, they work with complex numbers. And right now I'm showing both sides of the spectra. So at around uh, 4096, you'll have the actual DC value, so zero frequency. And on the left side will be the negative frequencies and on the right side will be the positive frequencies. And what you can make and see is that when we sample this, so multiplying with this continuous pulse strain, we end up with a spectral copy. So we sort of copy the spectrum uh, multiple times. So it, this is just demonstrating that the math is actually true. Uh, it is uh, when we sample we get sort of an infinite sum of uh, sample spectra. And this is actually important because <clears throat> there's a second effect that happens in, in sampling and that is that anything at high frequency will fold down. So if I have, for example, a radio or anything where I have a certain sampling frequency given by uh, FS, so this is again showing the uh, complex uh, frequency domain with a zero frequency here, and imagine that I have a signal of interest <laughs> somewhere around uh, zero. But there also is what we call blockers or unwanted signals at other frequencies. There might be one at slightly above FS half, and you know from, well, you should know by now that the, um, what's it called, the Nyquist theorem, that tells you that the part of the signal that you're able to fully reconstruct is whatever is below FS divided by two, or set a different way, if you want to fully re reconstruct a signal, you have to sample it at twice the bandwidth. That has actually been modified slightly uh, when it comes to um, sparse frequencies or sparse signals, so compressed sensing, and uh, it's sort of been generalized to be the average bandwidth actually needs to be less than half your sampling frequency. But in this case, we have unwanted signals outside our sampling frequency. And what happens when we sample is that those unwanted signals, they actually fold down. Now, the axis of symmetry is actually around FS half. So you can see this uh, pink signal. It goes from slightly above FS half to below FS half. 
and a signal that is at over the sampling frequency will actually fold down into DC. And now I have a problem because now I've mixed together my wanted signal, which is the green part, with an unwanted signal. And I'm screwed. I, I can't do anything. You can't fix this afterwards in digital. There is no way. Hmm. You can fix it if you have... No, you can't really fix it. <laughs> so we have to filter. We have to filter these unwanted signals before we sample. And that's where anti-alias filters come in. And this is very important, which means that in front of any switch kept circuits, you have to have some sort of anti-alias behavior. You have to take away the unwanted parts. So one way to do that is with a low pulse filter. It's just a simple analog filter. What's important is that that analog filter sort of um, dampens any high frequency components below where we ever we need them to be before we sample the signal. Because then after sampling, we only have our wanted signal. What's interesting with sampling is that it, it doesn't have to only operate on low frequencies or signals below the sample rate because the Nyquist theorem doesn't state that the signal that you're interested in or, or signal, yeah, the signal that you're interested in doesn't have to be below half the sampling frequency. It says the bandwidth has to be below. So that's two different things, which means that it's entirely possible to do what's called subsampling. Let's imagine that I actually wanted to look at the red part. That's my that's the interesting part I wanted to look at. Then I could actually add a bandpass filter to filter everything else, so the green part, the pink part before sampling, and now I'm only left with what I wanted, the red part. So this is called subsampling. And it's um, entirely possible to do that in ADCs. It's actually something that happens quite often when you when you um, test ADCs. If, if you forget that, uh, well, when we test ADCs, then we're fully controlling the input signal from with a si as a sinusoid from an instrument. But sometimes you maybe forget that in your pocket you have a phone, and that phone transmit at about a, transmits at about a watt. And that can actually introduce high frequency signals into your input or your ADC. And suddenly you will subsample that. Similar to, yeah, if you don't have an anti alias filter. But sometimes that's what you wanted. So maybe you want to actually look at the frequency content or the modulation that happens on your phone. And you can do that by just sampling directly at a low frequency. Yeah. So sampling is actually very similar to a mixing operation. Okay. So continuing on a bit on the squeak time, instead of writing these, okay, the spectra of this blah, blah, blah is the uh, time shifted sp uh, spectrum of my original analog signal. Well, I think this is purely a <clears throat> let's reduce the uh, clutter in our equation type of thing. So we quite often use the Z transform instead. And the way we do that is we have the uh, Z transform space and we write this e to the power of minus S and T. We write it as Z to the power of minus N. Now, Z to the minus power on minus n is actually quite useful because it gives you a direct indication of what the delay is on that signal. So for example, if I have zero here, then I'm looking at my x of c sample right now. <clears throat> okay. But have a look at the z transform if this is unfamiliar. Uh, maybe a quick recap also of stability and plot, pulse zero plots. There's a really good video by three blue, one brown. I think that's the one I've linked in here. Have a look at those because it's easy to get confused, um, I think, with pulse zero plots. 
because what we're showing with the pulse zero plot is really looking from above onto a 2D plane of the complex value S, where S is equal to some real value plus J omega. And J omega, that's the frequency part. So imagine that we kind of doing a, a frequency spectrum along the J omega axis of a signal. And every single, every single, at every single A, at every single A, we do an FFT. And we see how the frequency spectrum looks. Now at some A's, <laughs> we get maybe that there are a couple of uh, A's here where we get an infinite point. We get a spike or a, um, call it a resonance in our FFT. <laughs> sort of the, the FFT at that point goes to infinite. And that's usually where we mark it with an X. And wherever it goes to zero, that's where we mark it with an O. So looking at this pole zero plot is really looking down onto a frequency spectrum from above where we only marked out where we have values that go to infinite. That's the x's or zeros. That's the zeros, <laughs> pole and zeros. Now it should be obvious then that if we have pole zeros, for example, at the imaginary axis, then we have sort of a sustained oscillation scenario. If we have a value that is less than the imaginary axis, so the A value is negative, then we actually get sort of an exponentially settling behavior. And if we have poles that are above, so positive A values, then our oscillations will increase towards infinity. In the Z domain, there it's slightly different because in the Z domain, the spectra repeat every two pi. And that's kind of like wrapping everything into a circle. <laughs> so instead of having our pole zero plane, we now have the unit circle. So we have e to the j omega. And that has, uh, well, it that has a distance from zero of one, the unit circle. And now our pole zeros are really given by a complex number. It's the same type of complex mon number, but you don't, yeah. It's slightly different. It's a slightly different way of thinking. So you go from sort of a plane to a mapping onto a unit circle. There is a way to go between the Z domain and the S domain, and that's called the bilinear transform. That's quite often used if you want to make a discrete time filter. And you can make a discrete time filter by first starting in the S domain, looking at the um, S domain or the transfer function in the S domain in MATLAB, for example, get your uh, Butterworth filter in there, figure out what the coefficient is, And then if you want to make it into a discrete time filter, you can use the bilinear transform. As long as you are careful to ensure that uh, well, the bilinear transform actually requires that whatever poles and zeros you have in your system, kind of, or I don't know if it's right to say the bandwidth, but that at least that your sample rate of your discrete time system is about 10 times the highest uh, component or the bandwidth of the filter. Something like that. Have a look at the bilinear transform. This is sort of a uh, first order approximation. So let's make a filter, <laughs> a discrete time filter. Imagine that we took our capacitors and we collected the charge and then we uh, were able to accumulate the charge maybe with a function that looks like this. So the output of the next period is the sum of our sum coefficient times our input. That could be the C, for example, plus another C times the previous output. So we're adding to the previous output our input with some coefficients. We can uh, translate this into the Z domain. And 
here we can see how the the time delays become useful because we can actually change notation without changing what the equation means. So here in this case I have yz which means that yz is in the future <laughs> and I'm using the nows for the b's and the uh, sorry for the uh, x and the, the y on the right side of the equation. But I can also just multiply by uh, c to the power of minus one and then rewrite the equation and that just that's just shifting my time series a bit. Now I'm completely free to do whatever I want in the notation here. I can figure out the transfer function from the input to the output and that's given by this equation with some uh, just some algebra. Now <clears throat> if we look at the um, impulse response of this first order filter so just accumulating on top of our previous output signal then we get an input switch response that is defined like this. So we have some function of a's and b's and some function of k's. And now I've forgotten what the k is. Yeah, I don't remember what the k is. Look in the book. <laughs> um, and I've also written here that the figure 13.12 in the book is wrong. But anyway, what we can immediately see is that when n is larger than 1, so when the impulse response, when n is larger than 1, then we have a scenario here where we have an infinite impulse response. The impulse response doesn't stop. n goes to infinity. So this is what's called an infinite impulse response filter. Most, or many filters with feedback from the output back to sort of summing many feed, <laughs> let me say it differently, many filters with memory, where we're remembering what the previous output value was, are infinite impulse response. And in this case, we can also figure out that as long as, <clears throat> as long as the A is less than 1, and the b is less than 1, then we have a stable system. So as long as the poles, so where this impulse response, sorry, where this uh, transfer function goes to infinity, that happens at, yeah, that must happen at uh, a larger than the 1, right? Well, that depends. Depends on the a's and b's. <laughs> anyway, as long as the um, poles of this transfer function is less than or inside the unit circle, then the system is stable. If you're outside, then it's unstable. So, yeah. That's first order infinite impulse response filters. When it comes to how they look, well, we should expect, right? So if we, let me go back here. If I look at this equation, take the current input, multiply by a factor, add the previous output. That sort of should intuitively mean for you that we're doing in kind of averaging, <laughs> sort of. And we can see that here. On the left side, we have the... Um, sampled spectrum and adding the IIR filter introduces a low pass filtering of that sampled spectrum. We can also see that in the frequency domain where the frequency components, the these are the shifted spectrum basically, those are dampened. Okay. Quite often in digital, we also use finite impulse response filters, and that can also be written in the Z domain. We can just take uh, the three previous inputs and sum them, and that will always also give us a low pass response. And that's what's shown in the figure here. Quite often, we use this kind of um, mm, signal flow graphs. So we have the input, the x of n, 
and we sum that to the output. We take the previous, so z minus 1, that's the delaying the x of n by uh, one period. We take that, and so on, and now we have a low pulse filter. The finite impulse response filters, by their very nature, has a finite impulse response. So if I do an impulse, so uh, set x of n to 1, and the next period set it to 0, well, the first output will be 1 third, right? And then the next output will also be 1 third, and the next output will also be 1 third. So my impulse, resp impulse response will be 1 third, 1 third, 1 third, and then go to 0. So it dies out. Which means that finite impulse response filters, as long as we don't consider quantization, are inherently stable. Now, that was discrete time. The main topic for today is switch capacitor. But in order to understand switch capacitor, I think it's important to have some concepts of discrete time. <clears throat> so let's look at switch capacitor again. This is similar to the circuit we have had in the beginning, but now we've introduced the op-amp. So imagine the scenario where we've been able to store a voltage V1 on top of a capacitor C1. And we don't have it connected to the op-amp yet. And the C2 here, that is zeroed. So we have no charge. And because we don't have a charge across the C2, because we don't have a voltage across C2. And that's what I'm saying with these equations. The charge on C1 at the end of phi1 is V1 times C1. And then the charge on C2 is zero. Okay. Let's say I now open my feedback switch and the input switch, or not the input switch, but the, the switch I had here, I connect that to the virtual ground. At the beginning of this phi 2, what's going to happen is that the, the voltage across the capacitor cannot change instantaneously. That's the whole point of a capacitor. It resists a change in voltage. So, and the first thing that must happen is that the plus here, that's still at ground, right? So the, that didn't change voltage. Plus here is still ground. The other side, well, if the voltage across that is the same, then the voltage at this point, if I have V1 stored across the capacitor and have ground on the positive side, then the negative side of the capacitor here must be minus V1. And that must still be true here. So the first thing that happened must be that this virtual ground shoots down below ground to minus V1, roughly. I say roughly because there might be parasitic capacitances that changes that voltage slightly. But then what happens is that the um, op-amp, well, it will try to change the output voltage such that the virtual ground is the same as the plus side. And by doing that, it's changing the voltage at the output and thus changing the voltage across C2. So in order, this uh, virtual ground was minus V1. So we're increasing the voltage at the output until we get zero here. So that means that the output voltage here must increase to the point where we have ground at the virtual ground, which means there is no charge across C1, and all the charge that used to be on C1 is now found across C2. And that's what's said with the equation. So at the end of phi2 on the charge of uh, C1, the charge is zero. So the charge the charge on C1 at the end of phi2 is zero. The charge on... Did I say C2? I meant C1. Well, anyway. The charge on C2 at the end of phi2, phi that has to be the same as the charge on C1 at the, at the end of phi1. So the charge that used to be across the C capacitor if I now 
to the remove the charge or made it zero, that charge cannot disappear. It must be somewhere and must be across the feedback capacitor, which is what gives us the uh, equation here. And we can generate the transfer function. And let's just see um, V2 divided by V1 is C1 divided by C2. Let's just check that that equation is correct. So if we have C1, for example, is uh, 10, and then C2 is 1, then we get a gain of 10. And that makes sense, because we have a large charge being placed on a small charge, a smaller capacitor, which gives it a higher voltage. So these kind of kind of switch capacitor gain circuits, well, somehow we have to get this uh, charge on top of C1 in the beginning. And we can do that with a switch. So that's what I've done here. And let me go full screen. So on the left side, we have the input, which is discrete time. We, during 5.1, we sample the input across the C1 capacitor. During 5.1, we also reset the C2 capacitor. So the charge across C2 is zero. Then in the second phase, we have opened our 5.1 switches and we're closing the 5.2 switches. And the 5.2, well, the C1 will empty because the op amp will ensure that the minus input of the op amp is the same voltage as the plus input, thus placing no charge on C1 and all the charge will be transferred to C2 and change the output voltage accordingly. And that's what's shown on the right side of this uh, plot, is as we go into phi 2, well, then the op amp will start to change the voltage until we get an output voltage, or actually, yeah, an output voltage that gives us the same charge across, c not, mm, yeah, the same charge across C2 as we had on C1. Now we can also see that if we do not zero the charge on C2 in phi 1, well, then maybe we can accumulate charge here. And that's actually possible. Oh, uh, first the equations, I guess. <laughs> so, okay. So the transfer function of this uh, switch capacitor circuit is basically the, the output voltage in the next time period is equal to C1 divided by C2 times the uh, input voltage in the previous time period. Now inserting, translating from n plus 1 into z, we can see that in the z domain, the transfer function is c1 divided by c2 times z minus 1, which just means a delay, a delay of uh, one o'clock period. Was I what, was I, what I was about to s talk about was integrators, because if we don't reset the c2, so if we don't null the charge on c2, then every time, every single phi 2, we're adding a charge to the C2. So first we add a charge that is equal to Vi times C1. Second period, we do the same thing, then the same thing, then the same thing. So eventually, of course, this will, this will be a problem because we cannot get an output voltage that is higher than VDD or lower than ground, for example. But, this is a very good integrator because the integration is actually just given or the preciseness of the integration is given by loop gain of the op amp. And you should realize that in the previous lecture when we talked about filters, as long as you have an integrator, you can make a filter. And that's the same thing here. We can use these type of integrators in filters. We can set up the equations again. So we have the... Um, previous output voltage, so that's now stored on the capacitor, plus C1 divided C2, the input voltage, that's sort of the next output voltage, that is our actual output voltage. And we can insert, go from the sample domain here with the ends, so this is sort of uh, time units, discrete time units, into the Z, Z uh, domain, so we have VO minus the previous version of VO equals C1 divided by C2, the previous version of Vi. And we can sort of work through the equations and get the transfer function here. And then this is the transfer function of a discrete time integrator. Cool.
in switch capacitor circuits, capacitors don't have noise inherently. Resistors do have noise. Transistors do have noise, which means that although capacitors in themselves don't add noise, in switch capacitor circuits, we actually are storing noise, and we're storing noise during both the sampling period and the, what we call the charge transfer period. You can work through the equations, and you can figure out that the actual noise power is proportional to Boltzmann's constant times the temperature divided by C, which is why, why we often in switch capacitor circuits, we always talk about KT over C noise. And that's the same thing for ADCs. You always talk about KT over C noise, but quite often in voltage-based ADCs, we are sampling the input voltage across a capacitor. And that capacitor has to be large enough in order for us to get low enough noise levels. Which is why <laughs> when you make an ADC and you have to have, let's say, 18 bit, it's going to consume a lot of power. Because if it's in the voltage domain, you have to have a very big capacitor. And you can actually also see from this equation that it's the um, voltage power that is proportional to capacitance. So if you want to half the noise power, then you have to double the capacitance. No, four times, right? Anyway. <laughs> but just know that in switch capacitor circuits, both phases add noise. So the, the noise power in your switch capacitor circuit will always be higher than two times KT over C. I think it's good at this point in time to have a quick refresher of mathematics. Because there's one thing that sort of bothers me always sometimes when we talk about noise or uh, independent variables and that is we just say that whenever you sum two noise sources you can sum the variances to get the noise power or power sums as a sum of variances that's not entirely true well that's mostly true but not always so when we look at the mean of a single, which is top left, that's just defined as sum all the values that you have and div divide by the time period, and that's going to be your mean. The mean square, that is square your signal, and then you get, an, you get always a positive value here, and sum them over a certain time period and divide by the duration. And we've defined the variance as the sigma squared. So the variance is the same as the standard deviation squared is equal to the mean square minus the square of the mean. Now, if the, uh, means, uh, if the mean is zero, so we sort of remove the mean first maybe before we do the mean square. Sorry, before we do the square of the mean. No, the mean square then we actually don't have to think about the... Um, so let me start again. <laughs> if, we, if, the, if the mean of our signal is zero, then the mean square is equal to the variance because we can see that if the mean here is zero, then the variance is the same as the mean square. Okay, yeah. Now, the whole point of this is that if we have two independent signals, it can be noise sources, it can be signals, it doesn't really matter. We can sum them. And if we then look at the square of it, in order to do the mean square, then of course we get x1 squared plus x2 squared plus 2 times x1 times x2. And calculating the variance for those two cases or for that case particularly, we can see that the, the variance of the, the uh, sum signal, the total signal, is given by the sum of the variances plus a integral of what we call, well, this is basically a convariance. So if there is correlation between x1 and x2, 
then the sum or the variance of the um, sum of the signals will actually be higher than just the sum of the mean squares or in some other variances. And that's important. For example, if I have correlated noise sources, if I have a ground noise source that is coupling into my circuit at two points and then I'm summing those two signals, then I cannot just assume that I can sum the variances in order to get the total variance because you actually have to include the covariance important point and you should know this bit from before but a uh, quick reminder mathematics is fun <laughs> well not always but at least the principles I find fine I want to touch on also today a few of the circuits that we need in switch capacitor circuits the most important block is going to be the operational transconductance amplifier I talked about last time one of my favorite ones Actually, since last time, I have gotten, I sort of became doubtful whether my favorite op amp is actually the best op amp. Maybe I should do a comparison at some point in time. Maybe not this year, some other year. But I, I suspect that maybe the folded cast code or the recycling uh, cast code might be slightly better. I think what's going to be better is that in the fully differential current mirror op amp, especially when I make it a low current and the uh, one over GM of the current mirrors looking into the um, mirror nodes, that can actually create quite high frequency poles. So in order to get a uh, good stability, I have to add, oh sorry, low frequency poles, which means that I have to shift my dominant pole even further down. And there's quite a lot more dominant pole, uh, non-dominant poles in that di fully differential op amp. Anyway, I wanted to include today also a second op amp that you didn't see last time, and that's just a more traditional two-stage op amp. So we have a current mirror first stage, we have the tail current source. I'm only drawing half the op amp here. So the current mirror tail, so current mirror tail source. We have a mirroring of that to the output, so this is sort of the first stage with cast codes. And then there's a second stage, and here there's a mirror layer capacitor feeding from the output to the source node of the cast code. So this is a co quite common way to do the Miller capacitances. The Miller, capa Miller capacitance theory basically means that the effective capacitance that I see at the gate of this output NMOS, this common source output NMOS, is actually the gain of the output NMOS. So that maybe is 10 times or maybe 20 times or even higher, let's say 100 times, times the capacitor, feedback capacitor, plus one. So instead of seeing 500 femtofarad at the gate of the output transistor here, I might see a, a capacitance of 5 picofarads or even 50 picofarads, depending on the gain of the uh, common source. And that means it's easy, easier to add a dominant pole inside my two-stage amplifier. Because in a two-stage amplifier, it's quite tricky to have the dominant pole be the output. In order to do the common mode feedback, in this case, I have taken the uh, VON and VOP, Similar circuit to last time, just two resistors to generate the common mode between the VOP and VON. In this case, since I don't have any cast codes on the output, I'm not that concerned with actually using resistor directly. And then feeding that into a op amp, and then having um, one side of the op amp going to a transistor that can control the common mode on the first stage. Now, by controlling the common mode on the first stage and looking at the output stage, that will actually <laughs> automatically set the output common mode also. Although it will vary in the input common mode as a function of the VGS, I guess, of the uh, common source. So this is an alternative op amp. I've also included the BIOS circuit for that, so you can try that out if you want. <clears throat> in addition to the op amp, which is going to be the key component, 
you're also going to need switches. Now, you could maybe imagine, if you haven't done analog, analog circuits before, that switches are easy. That's a transistor, and transistor is a switch, at least according to the digital people. Turns out, switches are hard. They are also hard. <laughs> the challenge with a single NMOS is that we know in order to turn on the NMOS, we have to have a gate voltage that exceeds the threshold voltage. That's really where we have created an inversion layer in the channel. If we're operating below the threshold voltage, then the current, the, the, able, the transconductance, or the conductance that we can get in our switch is limited. So it's important to operate the switches in sort of inversion, strong inversion. But that also means that if my A goes close to my C, because I, I maybe I can't make the C higher than VDD. So let's lock C at VDD, which means that uh, at any time when A approaches sort of a threshold voltage below VDD, my NMOS will start to turn off. Mm, that's not good, because then the settling in the switch cap circuit takes longer, higher resistance. So what I could do is use a PMOS instead, PMOS instead, but then I get the same problem on the other side when the A approaches ground, which is why quite often we use a combination of NMOS and PMOS called a transmission gate to have a relatively low impedance over the full range of the input signal from zero to VDD. The challenge with transmission gates is that in the middle, then if the VDD is quite low, which it usually is in modern technologies, it can be quite hard to have low resistance in the middle when you have VDD half at the A. There's one trick that we can do, and we can actually change the bulk connection of our transistors, because we know that if we connect the bulk to the source, then we reduce the bulk effect of the transistor, which means that we increase the conductance or we don't make it worse. When we turn the uh, transistor off, then we can connect the bulks back to where they should be <laughs> to increase the off resistance. Now, quite often that's not even enough. And the only place to go then is to bootstrap switches. And in bootstrap switches, what we're actually doing is kind of like placing a battery between the source and the gate, such that you always have a gate source voltage that is constant, no matter what the A is. The circuit that you're looking at here is a way to do that. So it operates in two phases. If we look at the C phase first, during the C phase, we are connecting the, actually, let's look at the C bar phase first, because that's the, uh, yeah. So C bar, during the C bar, we are connecting the left side of the capacitor to ground and the right side of the, uh, right side of the capacitor to VDD and we're connecting the gate of the NMOS to ground. So this is when the switch is off. When the switch is on, we take that capacitor, which now has a charge that is proportional to the voltage, the VDD voltage. We place that between A and the gate, and that effectively places a kind of like a battery, it's a capacitor, but a capacitor with a non-voltage from your A to your gate. So you, you know that the transistor is always on, no matter if the A swings all the way down to zero or all the way up to VDD. What actually happens is that you're pushing the gate of the transistor far, transistor far above VDD. So this is a bit dangerous also because one of the main reasons for limiting our threshold voltage, uh, sorry, our uh, VDD voltage, supply voltage, is that if you have a too high voltage across the gate oxide of the transistor, it breaks. But in this case, we actually don't have too high voltage across the gate oxide because the source side, or sort of the channel, is at A, and the gate is at a, a VDD over that. So that's still sort of VDD. The, gates, the gate source voltage is still around VDD, even though the voltage on the gate might be up to 2 VDD. So bootstrap switches work very, very well 
and are used quite often in analog to digital converters and sort of switch capacitor circuits. But you have to be a bit careful because you're operating outside the rails. I uh, included a uh, an example of a switch a uh, sort of <laughs> a bootstrap switch. So this is a uh, an ADC I made many years ago, published in Journal of Solid State. Not in 130 nanometer. The solid state uh, ADC was in um, 28 nanometer FDSOI. But since then, I've ported the same ADC to 130 nanometer because I actually made a compiled ADC. Mm, this whole layout that you're looking at here is compiled for a few from a few text files. Actually, that's kind of fun. So if you go in here, you can see CIC and you can see IPJSON. And this actually describes to the program that I made how to do the layout of my circuit. Let me take an example. If I go in here and we look at my inverter, so there's a SPICE file that tells me the connectivity and how the NMOS and PMOS are connected, but this little JSON object actually tells my layout engine how to do the layout. So before you route the layout, it says to the layout engine, well, add a direct route in the polylayer on the net called A from any transistor with a gate, uh, uh, any, tr M uh, any NMOS transistor gate contact to directly sort of vert uh, horizontally to any PMOS transistor with a gate contact. And then in metal one, connect all the outputs, that's the Ys, in a pattern that goes whoosh, doom, doom. This is kind of like uh, ticks routing. <laughs> it just instructs the layout engine how to do it. And uh, I guess, what's this then? Yeah, if you have multiple transistors, just connect the gates. So this is sort of uh, a way to create instructions to, to codify all the cleverness of the analog designer uh, such that it's easily portable between technologies. So this uh, JSON file and the SPICE file was common between what I taped out in General Solid State and uh, what you're looking at now in uh, GF. That's just a long-winded way of saying there is a bootstrap, bootstrap switch in there. That's the one you see at the bottom here, if you can see it, if we can see my cursor. That's a bootstrap switch. So here you have the capacitor and you have the NMOS and so on. And you can see sort of how, well, you don't see it here. Well, so let's forget about that. <laughs> anyway, the last switch is actually a symbolic representation of the switch inside the ADC. So it has two bootstrap switches, two NMOSs, top and bottom here, because it's a differential signal. And those go on top of capacitors inside the success, su successive approximation ADC. And that's sort of a switch cap kind of circuit. In addition, it has a couple of dummy NMOSs, and that's actually to prevent, since these transistors have some capacitance from the uh, source side to the drain side, is it's to prevent signal from a differential signal when these switches are off from feeding into a differential voltage across my capacitors because that will sc screw up the bits like bit cycling in the sign. Anyway, switches are cool and can take forever to design. There's another concept that's really important in switch capacitor circuits because in order for the charge to be concerned, we have to make sure that we use what's called non-overlapping clocks. We can't turn on the phi one switches at the same time as the phi two switches. If we do that, then we lose charge. So somehow we also need to generate a non-overlap. And what you're looking at right now is one example of such a non-overlap signal generator. So it generates phi one, phi two, and you can adjust the non-overlap by changing the delay, the delay in the feedback loop here. So very, very simple, the digital logic gates. You have to simulate this though, and you have to make sure that overall corners, slow, slow, fast, fast, temperatures and so on, that you always have a non-overlap as shown in the picture on the right side there. 
An example use of a switch capacitor circuit, we can actually relate back to our temperature sensor. So if we think about, we have our delta VBE generator. So we know from lecture three that the circuit on the left side here will have a voltage across the resistor that's given by the difference in diode voltages. And that difference in diode voltage is actually given by KT divided by Q times the size difference, logarithm of the size difference. What I'm doing in this circuit is actually sampling that voltage across my C1 capacitors. So that differential voltage that we have between the uh, copied uh, diode one voltage at the top here and the diode two voltage at the bottom, that voltage we sample across our C1 capacitors during phase one. Also in phase one, Let me see. There looks to be maybe a mistake in the feedback here. I think I'm missing missing a reset switch. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> it looks like I'm not resetting the capacitors. I should have been resetting the capacitors. Anyway, the point of this circuit is that during phi 2, Weird, this is really wrong. Sorry about that. <laughs> because during phi two, or maybe I'm not wrong. Let's see. Phi one, we have the capacitor connected. So yeah, no, it's not wrong, sorry. <laughs> Let's try again. Let's start in phase two. So phase two, we have shorted the C1 capacitors, so there's no differential charge across the C1 capacitors, and we have done the same thing for the feedback capacitors here. So in phi one, now this cannot be correct. So in phi two, yeah, this definitely is wrong, I think. You see how confusing switch capacitor circuits can be? You get, so I drew this maybe a year ago or two, and now looking at it, I'm not sure I drew it correctly, or I can't really understand what I was thinking at the time. Because in phi two here, I'm clearly um, putting the op amp in unit gain feedback. So the point at the input here will be defined, but at that point, the capacitor is not connected to anything. So the charge across the C2 is whatever it is. And when I'm then connecting uh, in the phi one period, then the charge will still be there on C2, but I'm sort of transferring charge from C1. So I think what I'm actually missing here is that I should have reset also the C2 during phi two. Anyway, the whole point of the circuit is to make sure that the output voltage here is actually given by the transfer function we've seen earlier. And we know we can do that with switch capacitors such that the gain of the switch capacitor circuit is actually equal to 10 because we have a C1 of one picofarad and we had a feedback capacitor of 100 femtofarads. <clears throat> Let's see if I fix this uh, circuit and make it a bit more uh, elegant. The reason I think I've drawn it like this is because this actually gives a zero delay um, gain. So when as soon as I connect the phi ones here, the current to charge to the differential voltage psi one uh, phi one will also go through um, C two. So charging C1, the differential voltage on C1, that differential current will also go through C2 at the same time. So you get sort of a zero delay gain. But I do need to reset C2 at, uh, in, during phi2. So that's a mistake. Anyway, hopefully you learned a little bit about switch capacitor circuits. Like and subscribe. If you have questions, post in the comments. I may answer. <laughs>
Have a great day.